I've covered my tattoos, ladies and gentlemen. You'll be glad to hear. They're in places where you wouldn't want to see them, believe me. So interesting listening to what you were saying, Nadia, particularly, I think, because as someone who wears a dog collar as a matter of course, as indeed you do, on duty, I'm so conscious not only of the uh, relentless habit of others to project upon us certain assumptions mm. about our expertise in precisely reconciling the ideal and the actual life, um, a, a, a process fraught with pitfalls, but much more insidious is, in fact, the way we do that to ourselves, mm -hmm. the way when we kind of dress in our dog collars, the way when we go about our parishes doing our, uh, our priestly things, how dangerous it is that we too lapse into this notion that uh, we do that from a position of, uh, of expertise in matters in which there is no expertise. I'm very cheered always by the, the statement of Charles Peggy that the sinner stands at the heart of Christianity. No one is more competent in the matter of Christianity than the sinner, no one except the saint. My own predilections for believing my own propaganda are notorious, perhaps. <laughs> But one of the realities of parochial ministry is that you simply can't sustain that for long. And for me, it came early on in my ordained career when I was called out to a deathbed of a parishioner, um, a man who I love very much, uh, who is a great and faithful Christian, um, a salty character with a particularly grainy view of life, but deeply, deeply faithful. He was dying of uh, prostate cancer. And he was on a morphine driver in the nursing home where he spent the last days of his life on this earth. And so off I dutifully went. Rather a traditionalist, he was very fond of the Book of Common Prayer. So I took that with me, went into his room where he was receiving a regular dose of morphine to deal with the pain that was evident. And he was a little bit in and out of consciousness. So I opened my Book of Common Prayer and I turned to the Psalter and I read to him soothing psalms in the Coverdale version, thinking, knowing that that would be something that he would like to hear. I got through quite a few of them. He stirred occasionally. So I thought I would add, as an interpolation, my own comfortable words, if I can put it that way, to him. He stirred again. I carried on. Eventually, he sort of came to a, a version of consciousness and kind of indicated to me to come nearer. So I approached his bed. He had an oxygen mask on, which he removed, and I bent down and he whispered. I couldn't at first hear him. So I knelt uh, next to him, put my ear to his mouth, and he said, shut up, you stupid twat. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> They were his last words. <laughs> it was a lesson well learned that uh, there are certain realities into which we blunder, even equipped with all uh, the expertise that we bring with us to these tasks, even after three years of theology degree, two years of postgraduate studies, two years at the Kafka stroke Hogwarts finishing school of theological college. <laughs> um, nonetheless, there's realities we bump into, and those realities are always jagged, realities which always remind us of in, that in God's dispensation, uh, such things count for nothing. We discover ourselves, we rediscover ourselves constantly uh, as not the person we thought we were. And that is, of course, our great hope and our salvation. I remembered again going to, when I arrived at Theolo I had an unusual uh, induction into the life of the Church of England, having been a, a, in a pop band in the 80s, and then having worked in the BBC for 10 years, which is as near to ordination in the Church of England as you can get without ordination in the Church of England. And I remember going for my selection conference. Those of you who know the clergy of the Church of England may be surprised to hear that there's any selection process at all. <laughs> <laughs> But nonetheless, there is. And so I kind of left behind me my career in broadcasting, my former career in pop music, my comfortable life, and turned up for a three-day conference in which I was sort of pressed and poked and prodded by various people to see if I was suitable for this, um, this fate. 
And uh, it culminated with an interview with a senior selector who was the Archdeacon of Lindisfarne. Just that we have an Archdeacon of Lindisfarne is reason enough to get ordained. <laughs> I sat in front of him, he looked at me, and he had a folder in front of him, and he said, I've looked at your file, and I want to know this. Why does somebody like you want to get mixed up with a broken down, failing institution that's lost any sense of where it's going and doesn't know its future? I said, I'm thinking of leaving the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a note of reality. I mean, so often I think in our church discourse, we generate a sort of breathless excitement about what we do, this sense of uh, you know, the extraordinary adventure of vocation which we're about. And that's indeed true, but it is never what we think it will be because it's about reality. It's not about those fantasies that we all too readily import it. I got to theological college, I can remember uh, in, after about three weeks going to see my spiritual director and him saying, how are you getting on? And me saying, awful. Because I went to train in an Anglican monastic foundation in Yorkshire thinking that within those hallowed halls I would discover depths, wells of my own serenity in which the uh, ineffable love of God would bathe me in its golden rays and, <laughs> and all would be well. It didn't quite work out that way. Fantasy, of course, to think that it is in seclusion. It's through going to those misty, uh, marginal places that we will truly encounter the risen Lord and discover who we really are. I'm absolutely fed up of going into church bookshops or cathedral books, not this one, of course, obviously, and seeing <laughs> on the racks all those greeting cards filmed a, 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 of a soft, focused photograph of a misty stream tinkling down a hillside. <laughs> That's not really where I encounter God. I encounter God in the reality of places. So I remember going along to see my spiritual director and he said, how are you getting on? And I said, not very well. And he said, what's the problem? And I said, well, these people. And he said, what do you mean these people? And I said, well, they're not, they're not really doing it properly. Too. They're not here for the right reason and they're not doing it in the right way. They're venal, they're not focused, they're not committed. And he said, what else? And I thought about it and I said, I'm not as nice as I thought I was. <laughs> and he said, that's good. <laughs> and so it was the beginning of wisdom, isn't it? It seems to me that so often in our Christian lives, the moment when it gets interesting in relation to us is the moment when absolutely we reach those near horizons of our own competence, our sense of our own self-worth and self-importance, those stratagems for self-promotion, which we all deploy, run into them, you'll run into them soon enough. And that's where it gets interesting, when you encounter the reality of other people. I loved your book, Nadia, about unexpected saints and thought about the unexpected saints who I'd met and who'd formed me. Some of them not in the least bit suitable at all, I'm afraid. The irony for me, as someone who uh, came out as gay when I was 16 in 1978, and then uh, spent a lot of time involved in activism in the gay movement, uh, people might think that's kind of an odd preparation for ministry in a church which finds so much of that very difficult and intractable and embarrassing and awkward. But it is nonetheless true that I think the basic rudiments of living in community I learnt in the gay community and it was those that really took me forward to a place where I began to think how that would inhabit a wider context than the one I'd lived in. One of the most influential people in that was a chap called Mark Ashton. I don't know if anyone saw the film Pride, which came out a couple of years ago, which was about an unusual collision uh, of cultures in the 1980s, 1984, the miners' strike. And uh, I was in London then. London, was, of course, was a very divided place at that time. Uh, Margaret Thatcher, uh, her government formed in 1979 uh, in the Houses of Parliament. Across the Thames on the other side, County Hall, where Ken Livingstone presided over a very different culture indeed. And it was, London really sort of felt like a battlefield. And in that, people like me who'd run away from uh, the provinces, Kettering in my case, arriving in London in 1980, battle was joined. Notions of sexual identity, notions of gender, uh, the politics of feminism, the politics of class, a very heady, febrile time it was, uh, and all those things joined together. And to be a combatant in that, well, bliss was it in that dawn to be alive. And so we formed a support group called Lesbians and Gays Support the Miners. 
I don't think lesbians and gays had ever supported minors before in any organized way. <laughs> And so there was these extraordinary meetings where we would get in our minibus and drive down to the Delice Valley in South Wales and go to the, the, the Miners Social Club and they'd be confronted by a working class community, in some ways very traditional, who looked at us and we looked at them. And after a while, fortunately, an extraordinary friendship happened. Largely brokered, I think, through the tireless and courageous and holy efforts of Mark Ashton, who was not a Christian, although he'd grown up in a fiercely contested Christian world in sectarian Northern Ireland in the 1970s. Uh, someone who was deeply engaged in politics. He was General Secretary of the Young Communist League before that was embarrassing. And someone who had this extraordinary, I think it was an extraordinary, he, what is a saint? A saint is someone, it seems to me, who anticipates persuasively the life of heaven before you get there. Not always a consistent thing, not always easy to see. Very often unobserved, it seems to me. But Mark, in spite of all his commitments and in spite of all his, um, his ideological convictions, was someone who just managed to somehow, with him you sensed, that there was a kind of possibility beyond the narrow political possibilities in which we then lived, of achieving change without that costing any diminution of your sense of the dignity of the other. There's an extraordinary capacity for empathy, I think, which was the most striking thing about him. And to be part of his world, which was kind of, I mean, not only, he was, not only was he general secretary of the Young Communist League, but he was also a barman at the Conservative and Unionist Club in Argyle Square in King's Cross. <laughs> so there was a certain kind of breadth to his range. But he was somebody who just made light come on in places that had normally been in shadow and make sort of possibilities unfurl, unfold, that you hadn't seen before. Mark, uh, not, very, not very long, <laughs> I just remember an anecdote. Mark uh, made me go to, do you remember the, when Rupert Murdoch closed the, print, uh, the printers in Fleet Street and moved it to Wapping and there was a huge dispute with the, with the um, NGA, the National Graphical Union, I think it was. And Mark made me go down there to stand on the picket line to protest at this event. So we stood on one side, saying that inevitable refrain, the workers united will never be defeated, which usually is a prelude to a massive defeat for organized yes. labor, but there you go. <laughs> but there we were going, the workers united will never be defeated. Awkwardly for me, among the ranks of the police massed opposite with their riot shields was my older brother, Andrew. <laughs> and so in the middle of this thing, we were going, the workers united will never be defeated. The police were beating back on their shield, and all of a sudden he looked over his shield and he said, are you going home for mum's birthday? <laughs> <laughs> I've never been more embarrassed in all my life. <laughs> but even in that divided world, even across those battle lines, there was a sense that it was a kind of transcendent way of being together uh, that offered possibilities, possibilities of transformation possibilities of new life. Those are the, I mean, that's one of the reasons I think why I try to do what I do now. Um, my clerical career began in, in Lincolnshire at Boston Stump, where I was ordained deacon, served my title as, uh, as curate. And that was a fascinating place, wonderful medieval church surrounded by beautiful 18th century buildings in a sort of English town out of central casting. But behind those facades were life's Life were being, lives were being lived that were as tough as any I've come across anywhere. Poverty, deprivation, marginalization, heroin in particular, and its destructive effects on a community uh, really sort of um, defined what we did there. I learned an awful lot about what it was like to be somebody who woke up in the morning, not as I wake up in the morning, with the expectation that the day will be part of the continuing story of improvement, of betterment, that life gets better a sense that you can invest resources, time, commitment, whatever it is now, and that will bring forth the fruit in the future to your benefit and the benefit of humankind. Most of the people I was dealing with in those rough estate housing in, in Boston didn't. They woke up in the morning just trying to get through the day, thinking about the basic elements of survival. Very useful lesson for a clergyman to learn. And I remember once being called out to a funeral visit, and I went to the meanest street in town, at one of the meanest houses, a council house behind a very untidy garden, 
where one of the windows had been boarded up and the door was semi-kicked in. And there I found the son of the deceased, who was a man with learning difficulties. I sat in the house. Uh, it was a house that was thickly yellow with nicotine. It was a house in which your feet stuck to the floor as you moved through it. Um, it seemed like a documentary about poverty. I was slightly uncomfortable and awkward. He was uncomfortable and awkward too. He told me very little about his mother. I did the basic necessities I had to do, made my excuses and left. Turned up at the crematorium a week later or so to take the funeral and there was a huge crowd, I assumed for a different funeral, but no, it was actually for the funeral of his mother, the funeral of a woman about whom he'd been able to say nothing at all and for whom I did the most uh, cursory eulogy imaginable. But actually it turned out that she'd been a remarkable woman and the crowd that was there were there for her. And they were the children, abandoned, neglected, poorly looked after of that estate, who she had taken in, in various stages of distress and collapse and chaos in their lives. Some of them who had uh, been as perhaps as wild as children could imaginably be. Nonetheless, her door was open, they would come to her, and without sentimentality, without a view to uh, the opinion of the crowd. She'd simply done just the basic discipline of loving someone and of caring for someone and had given them a sense of a structure, a sense of their place in the world that took them to greater places. One of them I remember, the one I remember most of all, was a guy and he st stood out. He was a mixed race guy and he was wearing the uniform of a British army officer. And I spoke to him and he'd been a kid who'd grown up without any real parenting on that estate, who'd been taken in by her his life had turned around and had ended up becoming uh, commissioned in the British Army. Provided you think that's success, it's up to you. Um, and I remember talking to him and I said, what was the difference that she made in your life? And he said, it was simply that she just made me aware that a future was possible. A future was possible. Somebody who just opened people's eyes to a future that they hadn't thought of before. Um, a possibility of light coming into a darkness that was so dark they didn't even know it was darkness, they didn't even know there was a perspective at the end of it. Remarkable woman. Much to my shame, I, I used to do two um, eulogies for people in those days when, when no one would tell me anything about them. One went, Dot loved the crossword. And in a very real sense, there's one word, isn't it, that makes sense of the whole pattern, and that word is Jesus. <laughs> Sorry about that. And the other one was, Violet loved to knit, and often in a pattern, there's one thread that holds the rest of that pattern together. <laughs> I learned not to preach sermons like that anymore. Better to say nothing than to say something like that. But also, some of the saints who have affected me have been saints. I think one of the reasons why I do what I do now, or try to do what I do now, is because other people made it look possible. Simply that. Someone was doing serious, committed, church, Christian things without too great a sacrifice to their integrity or their honesty. One of them was a prebendary of this cathedral, John Gaskell, who I'm sure you'll remember very well, Mark, I'm sure many of you remember him, who was my first vicar when I came stumbling into a church in total distress and disarray at the age of 29, St. Albans, Hoban. John was the vicar there and a remarkable man. John played a huge part in getting me in landing me, I think, from the sort of chaotic final approach I made to faith. And for that I'm uh, uh, eternally grateful. Years later, um, Fern Britton decided to make a documentary about me for the BBC. And one of the things she needed to do for that long interview with me was talk to people who would tell her how marvelous I am. That took some finding, it has to be said. <laughs> but particularly around that period in my life, she said, I want to talk to somebody who was there uh, when you made this conversion, when you went from your life and entered into that church and, and events took a decisive turn. And I said, well, John Gaskell's the person to talk to. He said, well, would you call him, please, and ask him? So I did. So I phoned John Gaskell and said, um, oh, hello, Father. Hello, Father, how nice to hear from you. That was him, not me. And I said, they're making a documentary about me for the BBC, and they need someone who was around at the time of my conversion to talk about uh, that part of my life, that critical part of my life, and I couldn't think of anyone better than you. Would you, would you mind doing that? And he said, oh, Father, I would so love to help you. There's just one tiny problem. And I said, what's that? He said, I don't remember a thing about you. 
That seems to me a kind of priestly exercise of saintly virtues in a way, reminding us again of who we are and where the limits of our marvelousness lie. It's not really about us, is it? When we do our jobs properly, it seems to be it's about vacating space. It's we must decrease that he may increase, not as a kind of pious refrain, but simply understanding that when we do our jobs best, it's through the honest offering of who we are in all our brokenness, in all our jaggedness. And that's, I often think of the story of the monster of Glam's, Glam's Castle, you'll know where I think the Queen Mother was born, notoriously has an, a chamber within where the monster of Glam, some misshapen, monstrous, uh, faulty product, if you like, of that exalted line, a creature kept in a room which is uh, locked away. And whenever the next successor uh, to Glam's uh, inherits, then they're told the secret of the monster of Glam's. And apparently once they hung sheets in all the windows of that castle to see if there was such a room and there was one uh, window that was unhung and in that it's thought the monster resided. And it's a very powerful image, you find it in other folkloric stories too, but it seems to me so often uh, that's kind of us too. And I love that bit where Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount about when we go to pray, about going to the private place and praying in secret there to the Father. And I sometimes think that what we need to do is to open within ourselves the door to the locked chamber, that part of ourselves, the most, that awkward, embarrassing, difficult, shaming part of ourselves that we keep so carefully away from public view, to open that door and discover that there's no monster in there at all. There's simply another window, and through that window to let the light come. I've gone on too long, haven't I? Thank you very much.